Uh, right, I've, there's a lot happened because it's it's now been four months since I did one of these updates, but um, I've been tried to be very selective, although there's there's a lot of really exciting, interesting stuff uh, that I do want to talk about. So I will. Oh, there we are. I'll start off with a bit of optimism and it's not optimism about infrastructure. It's optimism about um, the, uh, the, the, the the other side of it, which is the. Um, the road danger reduction side. Um, I've um, in in the autumn, not long after the B network buses started to operate in Bolton, um, I had cause to make several um, complaints and reports to the police about the driving of uh, of drivers running B network buses. Um, and here are some examples. I mean, these buses are travelling at 30 miles an hour plus, and that is far too close to be passing a cyclist, as anybody that cycles will know. Um, so I did make reports on all of these and, and um, to their credit, the police actually did prosecute two of them or, or took two of them forward for prosecution and uh, sent a letter of warning to the bus companies uh, of the other ones. Um, but I also uh, put something via Twitter on into the B network, so it's TFGM, um, and they were quite responsive. And uh, so that was quite pleasing. So I did I did actually pass all the information through to them. Um, and from the police, yes, they took these forward to the central ticket office for the driver to be either prosecuted or to have to go on an awareness course. Why a professional bus driver should should give, get the chance to go on an awareness course, I'm not really sure. Um, but um, but so they acted and TFGM did act and it, and it actually was not just uh, because of me, it's probably because of other people as well who've uh, had compl who've complained about this. Um, there was a question asked in one of um, Andy Burnham's uh, question sessions about driver training and uh, buses being safer for pedestrians and uh, cyclists, and uh, he said yes, they're going to be there's going to be a B network bus driver training program, which is great. But the other good thing is that since then, um, I've noticed all of the B network buses have been giving plenty of space. The, the two top ones on that slide uh, are almost at exactly the same place. They're on Moor Lane, um, just coming away from the junction with Deansgate. Um, and the one on the left was uh, before I complained, and the one on the right is since. The, the same with the bottom one is actually, those are two different locations, but they're just giving examples. And I'm finding that all of these B network bus drivers are giving me plenty of space now. So um, if you do something about these things, it actually can work. And I, I think bus drivers, people see bus drivers as an example and maybe follow that example. And I actually had bus drivers pass me like the one on the bottom right and car drivers follow suit, which is great. So that's good. It's also good to see that this particular intervention is actually working. This is a picture that I took from one of my videos as I was going through uh, the Rothwell Street thing. Slightly tongue in cheek there. That's uh, an illegal electric motorbike that's coming through the um, through the barriers there. OK, so interesting research and data. Well, there's loads of stuff out at the moment, um, mostly during uh, February, I guess. Um, the uh, Institute for Public Policy Research has done a a superb report on um, the way that um, England um, could actually become a leader in walking, wheeling and cycling. It isn't at the moment. And you'll see from some of the statements on there um, that that's where they say England's path from a laggard to leader is not really talking about the past. It's talking about a potential future, I think. Um, and he said the UK government's vision for active travel has been ambitious but failed to deliver. Um, it talks about the uh, one of the reasons for that is um, just looking back at the cycling and walking investment strategy number one, which ran from 2016 to 2021, 0.2 percent of the total transport budget was spent on active travel infrastructure, capital projects, 0.2 percent. So that's two pounds in every thousand pounds, which is why the ambitions are not being met. Uh, there's a lot more interesting information uh, um, in, in that report, so I'd recommend you have a look at it. And I did provide a link if you if uh, if you look at the slideshow, that picture on the right, if you click on that, you'll get to, to the actual report itself. Um, one of the questions that was asked in the survey that this is based on was on a typical day, what is your main mode of transport? And this survey was across the whole of Europe. And by the main mode, they mean the one that takes the longest time. So 
walking actually has a big advantage over driving, for example, in relation to, to getting into this graph. And if you look at the UK, it's looking pretty pathetic, to be honest. Um, the uh, look at the Netherlands, as you would expect, it's um, it's 40 percent say their main mode is cycling. Another good few percent say walking and wheeling. Uh, if you look at the UK, we're almost at the bottom. And certainly on cycling, we're second from the bottom, joint second with Spain, I guess, uh, and so on. So, so you know, it's not inevitable that um, that uh, we were going to be so poor on all of this. But they do go on to make some really good recommendations about what, what can be done. Um, they also talk about the case for investing in active travel. And this is probably one of the most interesting things from our point of view, because if we're going to justify spending on active travel, then it's important to have these figures. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the detail on that uh, that pie chart there, uh, but uh, just have a look at it. And, it, and it, it, the case is so compelling. And there's some other things I'm going to talk about. Uh, we've talked about the fact that it's so compelling before, but we just have to keep making the case over and over again. Second thing I want to look at is the People and Places study and a, pub, uh, a paper that was published in the, within the last month or so. Uh, which looked into impacts of active travel interventions on travel behavior and health. Now, this is good because it's looked at uh, the uh, Mini Holland projects in outer London, uh, and they've got six years of data going across uh, across a, a, a wide range of these um, uh, these uh, Mini Hollands, which consists of on road cycling and walking routes, active neighborhoods, which or low traffic neighborhoods, which uh, make the place much more friendly for walking, wheeling and cycling because they eliminate a lot of through, uh, through traffic. And you can see there are a lot of really good things. And the one thing that really sticks out here, and I think we really should be bearing in mind in, uh, in Bolton, is low traffic neighborhoods, which are active neighborhoods, as we call them, have been shown to have a very high value for money. So uh, return on investment of 50 to 1 to 200 to 1. So that's that's just incredible. I mean, we, if if we spend a pound and we get two pound two hundred pounds back uh, in return for that, it's it's just. I mean, why not do it? Why not borrow the money into it? Because it's going to pay back uh, dividends in spades. Um, there's some interesting stuff about uh, the impacts of active travel interventions in those uh, those mini Holland projects, and again, uh, I think it's 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 interesting to see that. Um, these are they, they they divide the study into low dose and high dose projects. So low dose ones are where they've done a bit of tinkering around, maybe put a few crossings in that sort of thing. Uh, high dose ones are where they've made some really serious interventions and attempted to to provide a proper robust active travel uh, network. Now in this paper they've divided those into high dose schemes that that just concentrate on on main roads and on road facilities and high dose schemes that include LTNs. And you can see that where there are LTNs or active neighborhoods, the impact has been phenomenal compared to the ones where it's just an on road cycle route. Um, you still need the on road cycle routes, but you really do need to do the low traffic neighborhoods, which basically means removing the rat runs from where people live and where people shop and so on, so that people have to stick to the main roads that are designed for that purpose and not just rat run through small streets that aren't designed for that purpose. So again, that sort of fits with the um, with the high return on investment. Um, there's another um, study which is looking specifically at low traffic neighborhoods. Now, one of the criticisms of low traffic neighborhoods is the the accusation, which is not is usually not backed up by uh, evidence, that it pushes traffic onto neighboring roads and uh, neighboring main roads and actually makes matters worse for people who live uh, around those main roads. But the evidence from a huge amount of data coming from those uh, low traffic neighborhoods in outer London and inner London um, actually shows that they do result in a significant fall in motor traffic within the schemes, but very little change on motor traffic on the uh, low traffic neighborhood boundary roads. Um, so again, I would like to point out to somebody, I'm not quite sure who, uh, if the uh, active neighborhood project in uh, Oldham's estate were to be put in place, it's unlikely that it would put a lot of additional pressure on Astley Bridge Junction, which is what the, one of the concerns has been. 
Okay, so that's all interesting stuff. It's worth looking at those uh, those papers and reports. Now, the next one is SUSTRANS. Yesterday, uh, the latest version of the uh, edition of the Walking and Cycling Index was published. Uh, so that's the one for 2023. The last one was for 2021. Um, it's the thing that used to be called the Bike Life Survey, but then they realised that it's not just about cycling, it's about walking, wheeling and cycling. Uh, again, if you click on that image in the slideshow on uh, Google Drive, then um, uh, you can uh, go to the actual report itself. Uh, but I want to just pick out a few things that uh, they've put as highlights. If you look at um, this question, uh, percentage of residents who would like to use different types of transport more or less in the future. The, it's, it is so compelling, the case for active travel on the basis of popularity. 49% compared to 5% would do it less uh, for walking and wheeling. Public transport, 30% more uh, say they would do more if they had better public transport. 40% say they would cycle more if they had decent um, um, infrastructure. They would they would like to do it. Now, the other thing, interesting thing is I, I've highlighted it, on, I've under, underlined it in red there. 38% of residents in Greater Manchester have said that they often use a car because no other transport options are available because it's too hostile to walk and cycle and the public transport isn't good enough. Um, so more things there. 35% of all residents think the level of safety for cycling in their local area is good. So 30, so 65% um, don't think it's good. 28% um, think the level of safety for children cycling is good, and it isn't. I mean, you wouldn't put, I wouldn't let children ride on the, the roads nowadays uh, in Bolton. 41% um, of all residents think their local area overall is a good place to cycle. So that contrasts to the other 59%. Similarly, in terms of uh, government spending, the number of people that would like to see government spend more on walking, wheeling, cycling and public transport far outweighs the number of people who would like the government to spend more on enabling people to drive. So, again, it's it's just so compelling. And one of the, the things that um, one of the problems we have in getting these uh, these projects to to fly is the belief, particularly among councillors, that. Uh, there's a huge backlash and nobody wants these things. Well, actually, a large number of people do want them and the backlash is from a very small number. And this is actual data on uh, on perceptions and, and what people would like or not like. It's the silent majority that we're hearing from here. And then finally, uh, among Greater Manchester residents, there are all these uh, very interesting things that have been, uh, been quoted in there. I won't go through them one at a time, uh, but for example, I'll just pick one uh, for, for people like me who tend to walk with the pram like now actually now with a, a double push chair side by side push chair for two grandchildren. 60% um, support a banning of vehicles parking on the pavement against 21% who oppose that. That's all across Greater Manchester. So if, if the government would just get its finger out and do something about the consultation that is now three years old and we've still not actually announced the, uh, the results then uh, we might actually get something like the ban that now is in Scotland uh, and is actually making a big impact in Edinburgh. Okay, moving on then, government, um, DFT, etc. Uh, only one thing to talk about here, and that is, uh, I, I try and attend every week, as some others here perhaps do, uh, the Active Travel Cafe. And um, shortly after our first meeting of this year, um, I got to the Active Travel Cafe and it was, it was told there's a there's a surprise guest going to come. And uh, it turned out that it was Brian Deegan. Uh, nobody knew he was coming, but uh, he did an absolutely fantastic um, talk off the top of his head, as he always does. Um, I went into it feeling perhaps a little bit depressed about the way things are going on active travel around here. And I uh, came up, came out fired up again. And some key things that he mentioned was which I think are really important things uh, and sort of fits with what I thought the, the direction of travel was anyway, uh, generally on active travel and how it's seen and funded. Uh, he said, what's changed at active travel is we are now looking at everything. So if it's CRSTS, Leveling Up Fund, Active Travel Fund, Major Roads Network, everything comes across our desk. Now, when Active Travel England first was set up, it was only looking at things that were specifically active travel funding. So the active travel fund, basically. Now, 
all projects that are government funded come across their desk. And his statement is there is no such thing as an active travel scheme, but there's no such thing as a scheme that isn't active travel. Um, he said a lot of this is coming from the uh, the Minister for Roads and Local Transport, Guy Opperman, who's been very uh, supportive. And it was him that he that suggested uh, to Brian that he push for this uh, to get everything coming across their desk rather than just the active travel um, uh, ring fenced stuff. Maintenance. He likes to see maintenance as improvement of what's there. And that means maintenance could include anything. It could include uh, correcting the mistakes of the past, not necessarily just dealing with uh, with decay. And that sort of feeds into one of the discussions we had at the last meeting. He said loads of good things are happening. And actually, um, I, if you click on Brian's picture on the previous slide, you will go to the um, to the YouTube uh, video of the talk. And I, if you really want to be enthused about all of this stuff, then I recommend you go and listen to that because it's uh, it, it really is upbeat and um, and it said a lot more than I'm actually talking about here. And it, but he also mentioned this about modes. And again, I've, I've particularly picked up on this because of a, a discussion we had in the in the previous meeting. Um, he says that all ex, all schemes now must cover all modes. They must address all modes. So it, you you if you want, you can call your scheme a walking only scheme. But if it doesn't address all other modes, including cycling, we won't approve it. And the reason he gave for that was we know there is a huge pent up demand for cycling and all the data suggests that. So that's that is the attitude that's coming from um, uh, from Active Travel England. So that was that was that was really great. It, um, I'd, I'd been thinking about just backing off from all this stuff and, and giving up, but uh, he sort of fired me up to uh, to carry on. OK, backlash and litigation. In fact, this isn't so much about backlash. It's about litigation. If you remember in a previous meeting back in it's probably the November meeting, was it? Um, uh, I talked about the uh, the this crazy war on the motorist thing that um, that Rishi Sunak put out and uh, the legal challenge that the Transport Action Network was um, bringing forward to the cut in funding. Uh, that had been announced earlier in the year or had sort of not been announced that so much as just sneaked in on the back of something else. Um, that's actually still ongoing. Um, the, I said before, the, the permission was granted for that um, judicial review to happen. Uh, we've not had any news on whether that's happening. But a development, a further development on that was in relation to the withdrawal of the statutory guidance because the very day that, uh, that Rishi Sunak made that, uh, that did that interview, um, that appeared at the top left uh, screen uh, screenshot on there appeared. This statutory guidance was withdrawn on the 2nd of October 2023. The, that's the statutory guidance under the Traffic Management Act of uh, 2004 uh, requiring local authorities and highways authorities to basically to reallocate road space for walking and cycling. Um, and um, the, it, that was replaced by the plan for drivers, if you remember that. I'm not going to go into detail because we've already covered that in a previous meeting. You can look at that. Um, well, that now there is a new legal action that's been started, which is about the withdrawal of the statutory guidance. And it's actually being pushed by Dale Vince, who's the founder of Ecotricity. Um, I suppose you could call him a green capitalist. He's someone who, uh, who really gets all this, um, this stuff, um, but also knows how to make money. Um, and he's working with the Green Britain campaign to bring a judicial review um, against the government uh, about their decision to, to just cancel the guidance uh, on, um, on active travel infrastructure uh, implementation. And so I've, there's a list there of all the grounds of that. And again, I'm not going to go through it. Uh, I've put a link to the, uh, the solicitor's uh, website or where the page is that, uh, that tells you all about this. So uh, that's another one that I'm going to watch and, uh, and we'll bring back in future uh, times. Now, what I want to do, this, this, there's a lot here and I'm, I'm, and I'm going to try and whiz through it very quickly. What are other councils doing? I've said something about this a few times um, in previous uh, meetings, but uh, I want to look at what other people are doing in other countries. And again, I'm sort of picking up on something that, uh, that Dominic said about the need to do these things uh, properly and that it takes a long time to do these things. And I mentioned at the time 
um, or in the chat that, uh, well, Seville has actually shown that it doesn't have to take a long time to do these things. Now, it just happened that a couple of weeks after that um, I'd said that, um, an article came out from Mark Wagenboer, who is uh, who uh, is in, on social media as Bicycle Dutch, and he does some excellent articles on all this stuff and videos. Um, and he actually had been to Seville, uh, and he wrote an article on how Seville achieved uh, what it has achieved. If you click on that picture, you will actually go to the article itself. Now, the thing was that in 2006, when there was a change of the, um, the government of Seville, um, a commitment was put in place to complete an 80 kilometre cycling network all in one go. Not a little bit at a time, but all in one go. Uh, and the motto was build it fast, don't build it fancy. And if you look at that example on the screen there, uh, that's just using uh, wands. They're not wand orcas, they're just wands. Uh, but that's to separate out the cycleway from the um, from the main traffic way, the main uh, carriageway. A lot of the what they've done was done by removing car parking and replacing it with cycleways. Uh, which has the additional advantage of moving people walking further away from the traffic, uh, from motor vehicles. And uh, guess what? The sky didn't fall in when that parking was removed. Um, what they did was, um, they, uh, if you look at this map, the solid lines were implemented between 2006 and 2007. And I've put on that map um, for scale uh, an eight kilometre marker. Eight kilometres is roughly the distance from Bolton Town Centre to Horwich Town Centre. Um, so all those solid lines were done in two years. The dash lines were done between 2007 and 2011. What I want to do is quickly look at the, the, the effect of that. So just looking at what they implemented, um, that diagram, the thing on the right is the current cycle map of, um, of Seville. Um, there's actually a lot more to the left on the other side of the canal, but that isn't formally part of Seville. Um, the whole thing is 12 and a half kilometres, which is about the size of Bolton Borough across from one end to the other. Um, the, um, in 2006, they had 12 kilometres of protected cycleways. By the end of the next year, they had 80 kilometres. In 2011, four years later, they had 164 kilometres and now they've got 180 kilometres. And if you look at the impact of that in those first few years, the first, um, uh, not the first bit there, but between 2007 and 2011, they had 5% of modes of uh, trips made by bicycle. 2009, 6.6, 2011, 8.9. So in the space of four years, they'd almost doubled the amount of cycling. Public transport had gone up because uh, with more people cycling and walking, um, the congestion was reduced, so public transport became better. Motorbikes are listed there, not much diff much change there. Cars down from 57.7% to 48.3%. So that is, you know, in that kind of time scale, that's a really significant change. Um, that's what one of the uh, the infrastructure looks like now. I've just put that in for fun, really, so we can see what it looks like now. Um, they've tended to do fairly cheap and cheerful implementations and then upgrade them in the future, which is what most successful um, active travel projects have done. But if you look at this, estimated trips using this infrastructure, from 2006, I think it was 0.5 people uh, percent of trips were cycled. 0.5%, one, uh, I don't know, uh, I, can't, I can't do the math now, but, uh, but if you look at the way that went up between then and 2011, in six years, they'd gone up to that level. So we're talking about 70 odd thousand trips. That's leveled off and, um, and sort of bumped up and down. But now what's happened is, if you just forget about the COVID period, because there's a bit of a dip for the COVID period, the introduction of e-scooters has meant that the fact that they had this infrastructure in place meant that e-scooters could be used for, for, uh, for travel. And that's brought the number of uh, trips using this infrastructure up to about, what's that, 110,000 uh, trips a year. So it's a, again, it's a phenomenal change in the first part for cycling 
but then other micro mobility modes actually start to take advantage of that especially now that we have um, decent batteries that can uh, can store enough energy to get people from one place to another without dragging along a, a couple of tons of, um, of steel box around with them so what does that mean for infrastructure well i'm, I'm going to make this point what I'm hearing from Greater Manchester, from TFGM, is, oh, well, these things must be done properly and they take an awfully long time. In Seville, it's just do it. Get on with it. Don't faff about. And uh, they, they're getting results. We're not really. Um, let's look at Paris. I've talked about Paris before, and lots of people know about the revolution that's happened in Paris over the last only four years. Um, the pictures on the right are, are quite familiar. That one on the bottom is... Um, uh, Rue de Rivoli, which is next to the um, uh, Jardin de Tuileries near the um, Tuileries near the, the Louvre. Uh, that is actually the same place a few years ago. That's what it looks now. That's what it looked at, at four years ago. Uh, but that's not the only thing. They've not stopped doing this. They're putting in huge changes to allow people to to switch from cars to active travel. And in when Mayor, um, when the Mayor Hidalgo was elected, um, there was a there was there was a, a, a very clear commitment to the this plan to uh, to introduce more active travel. And in um, not long ago, 54.5% for, for of Parisians voted have voted recently to increase the price of parking passes for cars weighing more than 1.6 tonnes. Now, one of the problems that we have on the roads is cars are getting bigger and bigger and heavier and more and more dangerous for people walking and cycling. They're trying to deal with that and they're doing it by putting really quite prohibitive parking charges on people with large heavy vehicles so um, a six hour stay with an suv will cost 225 pounds uh, euros 192 pounds compared to 75 euros for smaller vehicles so that's one thing that they're doing they're doing all sorts of other things they've actually switched their attention now they've done a lot for cycling and to some extent walking now they're putting a lot of stuff in for walking as well as expanding the cycling uh, infrastructure out as well but the one thing i want to focus on now is school streets because they've really gone to town on school streets and what they call a school street is unrecognizable compared to what we call a school street and if you click on this uh, this uh, image in the slideshow um, you'll be taken to a fantastic video about the school streets of Paris. So they did, they were in the Mayor's Manifesto and people voted for it at that stage. The target is 300 school streets by 2026 and they already have 180 in place. The benefits to the community are huge, not just for the schools. That's been shown by lots of research and, and polling of people. They, uh, the way the approach that they use with this is use temporary measures first, see how it goes, monitor and evaluate, ask people what they think, and then either remove it or make it permanent. Every single one of those, the ones that have actually reached the end of the trial have been made permanent now, properly permanent with paving, landscaping and so on. And there's huge public support for this. Uh, so here's an example. That's one that was turned into a school street with temp it, it isn't a school street at that point. But what they have now is that. So that's their idea of a school street. It's not something where people in high vis vests go and put their hand up and say, no, you can't come through uh, at this time in the morning or this time in the afternoon. They say this is a school street. This is a place for people, not a place for motor vehicles. So, again, I'm only a bit uh, a bit sarcastic here and uh, perhaps a bit. Uh, unkind, but Bolton's approach, uh, really putting it in a fairly cruel way, is let's just try one school for one day a week and make sure there's car parking nearby so people don't actually have to change their behaviours. Paris, just do it and it will work. People get on board and they love it. Santa Monica, well, they don't hang about in in, uh, in Santa Monica because what they're doing is they felt that they're going to do this over the, across the whole of the um, uh, of the city. Why don't we invest in machinery that makes it very efficient? And this is a machine that extrudes protected cycleway, and uh, it's not perfect. There's a little bit of concrete left there which somebody has to sweep up. But basically, this is just going along the road, putting a huge concrete curb in uh, to make a cycleway on this side. Um, so it doesn't have to take huge amounts of time 
to, to do this stuff. Um, if you click on this uh, picture, then you'll be taken to a video showing that, that that machine actually working. And, you know, if you're really committed to doing this, it's worth putting the investment in to have the equipment that will make you do it, that allow you to do it very efficiently and, uh, and quickly. OK, finally, on engagement. Uh, yes, Bolton Critical Mass is still ongoing. Um, those are the figures we've had up to now. Um, I'm hoping that uh, that things might pick up a bit more in the not too distant future. We we were uh, we were invited to come and talk to um, uh, a meeting of the Bolton Extinction Rebellion in the um, in the library cafe, uh, and it was a really good event. There weren't a huge number of people there, but the people that were there were really excited about uh, what we had to say about active travel uh, and what could happen in Bolton. Um, so I've had quite a few people ask now about joining this um, through that. And so that's another bit of engagement that's happened. Uh, and there are other people uh, in this meeting who were there as well and uh, contributed to the to the discussion. So that was that was great. And, you know, when you talk to people about all of this stuff and you get them to try and get them to understand what it will be like if we can get the infrastructure in place, then they really get on board. And it's uh, so so let's let's just try and make it all happen.